Good morning, everybody. Man, I, I feel like I'm at the house. I'm, 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 we're good. But before we even go any further, let's take some time to pray this morning. Uh, Lord God, we do bless you and thank you so much for the opportunity um, to get into your word. Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would give us hearts to receive. Your word is good, Lord, and I pray that we would feast at your table this morning. So, Lord God, thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm back. And, um <laughs> It's, it's just been really, really sweet um, being a part of this church, being a part of this body, uh, always feeling loved and cared for. And what's, what's been new for me these past four years is, man, just the interaction across all different groups. I've, I feel like I'm tasting a little bit of heaven, and I never want to let that go. So uh, thank all of you for being who you are, part of the body of Christ. So let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2, we're going to go through the entire chapter, but we're only going to read certain, spot, some, certain parts. So we're going to start this morning and read the first four verses, and as we move, we'll just read. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read the first four verses right now. And it reads, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came... From heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A young man moved to a city he knew nothing about. He was able to move in with a family who helped him with his transition. One day, the husband of the family decided to take this young man to play basketball. What's interesting is all of the men in the gym love Jesus. Doesn't mean all of the men could play ball. Many of us couldn't jump over a sheet of paper. But before the games started, every man circled up at center court touching one another. This young man looked around the circle and saw men who loved the Lord Jesus just offering up prayer requests and other men praying. It wasn't about basketball. It was about seeking the Lord who could answer prayer. A couple of hours later, this young man would find himself sitting at, at lunch with three men. During this lunch, the three men took turns sharing with this, with this young man sharing with him what it means to be a godly man who works. What does it mean to be a godly man who pursues relationships? What does it mean to be a godly man in our world today? This young man, now being in a city he knew nothing about, is able to establish godly relationships. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of the church. As we come to Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the church, and we're going to see it on fire, ablaze, and God do great things through his church. But before we get to talking about chapter 2, let's recap and look at what happened in chapter 1. In chapter 1, at the beginning, we see the resurrected Lord now meeting with his apostles. It was 11 of them. Judas is dead. He's gone. There's 11 of them. For 40 days, based on Luke 24, Jesus takes these men through intense training, showing them that everything in the scripture was about him. In this intense training, he also had to prove, continually prove, that he was alive. Then in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, he tells them, you need to stay in Jerusalem because you need power. Verse 8 says why they need power. They were going to be his witnesses. But they just weren't going to witness next door. Jesus gave them a global vision. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Got to be overwhelming when the Lord Jesus now puts the world on your heart and it should have been overwhelming. Jesus tells them, don't leave Jerusalem. You can't do this without power. Jesus is now taken out of their presence, being exalted. Verse 12 says that they obeyed what Jesus said. They go to Jerusalem and they wait. Those 11 apostles go into an upper room, and Scripture says that it was also 100, it was a total of 120 people in this room. But they just weren't there twiddling their fingers messing around. They were busy. They were praying, devoted to one another, and looking to the Word of God because 
they realized that there was a vacated spot that needed to be filled. So Peter, stepping into the role of leadership, begins to point them to Scripture, showing why we need this position to be filled. They begin to pray. Lord, we need you to show us who you are going to put in this position. Verse 26 of chapter 1 says that the Lord chose Matthias. Now in chapter 2, all of that kindling that was in chapter 1, all that good wood, is now set on fire. It is ablaze in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit has come and indwelt these believers and given them the power to be witnesses. This is important for us because we need the same power to be effective witnesses for the glory of God. And we have that same mission that we saw in Acts 1 and 8. That's for us. So it's important. So as we get ready to look in chapter 2, there are three big themes that we're, where we're hanging our hats. Number one, we're going to see the Spirit poured out. Secondly, as we walk through the text, we're going to see Spirit-empowered preaching by Peter. Finally, we're going to see the behaviors of a Spirit-empowered community. Again, we're going to see the Spirit poured out. We're going to see Spirit-empowered preaching. And then we're going to see the behaviors of the Spirit-empowered community. So let's look at the first 13 verses, and let's see the Spirit poured out and what happened. Verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost arrived. What is Pentecost? Pentecost in the Old Testament was a Jewish feast that was also referred to as the Feast of Weeks, which was a celebration of the early weeks of harvest. It was also a time of worship for Jews from all over the then known world. It was in this context where you had Jews from everywhere in Jerusalem that God decided to flex, drop his spirit, and dwell people. Look at verse 2. It says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It says, Everyone was filled. This feeling of the Holy Spirit was not just for those who taught or who was involved in ministry. This feeling was for every individual. Regardless of their lot in life, the Spirit has now indwelt all of these men and women. And Scripture says in verse 4 that they began to speak in other tongues. These, uh, these tongues was a language people could understand. It was an intelligible language. We know that because... Verses 9 through 11 says that there were people from everywhere, and at the end of verse 6 it says that these people heard them speaking in his own language. This was not the tongues of 1 Corinthians 14 where Paul says that some people were speaking in a tongue and someone needed to interpret. No interpreter needed here. People could understand what was being said. So here are these spirit-filled believers Speaking in another tongue, in verse 6 says, at this sound, people came together and they were bewildered. Because verse 7 shows us that these were Galileans speaking in this new tongue. Galileans, we know from Scripture, they had like maybe an accent or, or from, based on the book of Acts, many people saw them as unlearned. Now, here are these unlearned people speaking in a language that they never knew. They didn't go to school and learn this. See, these Jews, they could speak Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. They weren't speaking this. They were speaking in their native language. What is this showing us? This shows us that we do not have to readjust who we are to be able to hear. God meets us right where we are. So he's, he, he empowers these Galileans to speak in a language that they've never known. And they hear them. And so the people are bewildered because these are Galileans. Who were they? It says Parthians and Medes in verse 9, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia. Verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya. Verse 11, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. People from all over. Hear these Galileans speaking. Why were they speaking? Why were they speaking in this new tongue? What we see here is God breaking down barriers to hearing the gospel. He's destroying them. 
in this context, he destroyed the barrier of language. Among us, God is destroying all barriers between us, racial, ethnic, whatever they may be, so that we can clearly hear this gospel. He's destroying barriers. And so what were these people saying? Verse 11 tells us what they were saying. Because the people say, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. They weren't just arbitrarily just speaking a language just to speak. They had praise on their lips. They wanted to go around and make sure that the people heard we are proclaiming and praising the name of our God who has done mighty works. So they hear this. What is going on? We hear these mighty works. I can only imagine maybe they're speaking of the God who parted the Red Sea. Armies coming behind, ready to be destroyed. God said, no, water, I need you to separate. Stand still. Walk through. Destroy. They hear this, and they're moved. So much so that in verse 12 it says, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? What does it mean that these people are speaking in a new language? But then you had some people who came to worship but didn't have a good worship experience. They started to mock. They said, they filled with new wine. They drunk. <laughs> Peter says, in, in this, and we're going to get to it, Peter's letting them know, like, no, no, these are not drunk. It's too early. <laughs> but what we do see in these first 13 verses that's important for us, the spirit now drops on a people equips these people to be what Jesus told them they were going to be witnesses. So they are witnessing to the power and works of God in these verses, and people are hearing this. Important for you and I. He equips us with this spirit as believers to go out and be his witnesses. We're not here to talk about our own agenda or what we want. God, he's going to give you money. Get away from me. Talk to me about the works of God and how he has come to save me. What he, how he wants to use me to impact this globe. This is, these people are proclaiming these truths. The Spirit is at work. When the Spirit is at work, amazing things happen. The Spirit can make 2 plus 2 equals 632. We don't even know how he does that, but he does it. And we just rest in that because when the Spirit is at work, all we got to do is we, we don't know where he's going, but we say, I'm hitched, I'm for the ride, let's go. So in the first 13 verses, we see the Spirit poured out on people. From verses 14 through 41, we're going to see Spirit-empowered preaching by Peter. Spirit-empowered preaching. So let's look at it. Verse 14 says, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Peter says, it's 9 a.m. in the morning. They're not drunk. But I'm going to explain to you what you see. This is something new. See, in the Old Testament, the, the Spirit comes on people for a season and maybe leaves. Now, instead of just coming on, being beside, the Spirit is now in. So he points them not to what he thinks, but he points them back to Scripture. He uses the prophet Joel. Look at verses 17. He says, And in these last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter is letting these people know that what you see was promised before. God promised that he was going to pour his spirit out on all people. You see it. Don't be amazed. God had already foreshadowed, told this in the past. And Peter has this rooted in Scripture. Then he moves from here, and now he begins to talk about the works of Jesus. And he does it beautifully because he talks about the life of Jesus, then he talks about the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the exaltation of Jesus. Look at verse 22. It says, Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, 
Notice, as you yourselves know. Peter is saying to these people, like, you, you're not ignorant of the works of Jesus. You know about it. It's been before you. It's been attested. What's interesting here, as I look at that, is we live in a context and a place where we have people saying, Jesus didn't do that. He's not God. He didn't, he didn't do miracles and all of this stuff. We have people who doubt. But Peter says to these people, you know it. It's before you. Then he moves from talking about the life of Jesus and all that he's done. And then he begins to talk about the death of Jesus. He says, this Jesus, delivered up, d- delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter says, here now, Jesus being crucified was God's idea. God did this. He determined that he was going to come and pay the price for your sins. He did it. But then Peter does something else. He points to the sovereignty of God and how God is in control, how he did it. But then he says, you crucified and killed him. God is in control, but you did it. I can only imagine the hearers now being perplexed and now having to really think deeply. Because they're coming from everywhere. And you, First of all, you said God determined this, but I killed it. But then he, he moves from the death of Jesus and now goes to the resurrection. Verses 24 through 32 And as he speaks of this again, he grounds his argument in Scripture. Look at verse 25. He actually quotes Psalm 18, verses 8 through 11. He says, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. The Lord Jesus has been raised from the dead, and Peter wants them to know this. Yes, you know about his life. You know that he's been crucified and killed, but he ain't dead. There's no grave that can hold him. He got out. He's been raised. Then he moves from the resurrection of Jesus to his exaltation, verses 33 through 36. Again, he roots this in Scripture. Not in his opinion. And he quotes Psalm 110 and 1. Look at verse 34. It says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, right now, ruling and reigning. Peter wanted these people to understand who this Jesus is and what he has accomplished. He lived a perfect life. They killed him. We killed him. You killed him. But he got out the grave. And now he's at the right hand of the Father. Verse 40 in our text lets us know that this sermon was a lot longer than what we have in our text. Luke tells us that. But Luke just gives us what we need, the nuggets of what Peter actually proclaimed. And if you look at verse 37, you will get the response of the people as they heard this. Verse 37 says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Very important question for those who do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. When the gospel is proclaimed, right response, what should I do? I see my sin. I see the greatness of God. What shall I do? Here we have personal relevance and personal need. The rel- it, it, it applies to all of us. Peter had just told him, you killed him. You crucified him. It applies to us. It's relevant for us. But it also exposes our need. There was a personal need here. In verse 38, Peter answers what they should do. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter tells them simply, repent and believe. He offers them great grace after he has shown them their great sin. Repent and believe. Trust in him. He's done it. You're going to receive salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because you now have received salvation, go be baptized. Let everyone know who you follow. So these people heard this message. And it was so convicting and so powerful. It was spirit-empowered. 
Peter was not speaking out of his own energy and out of his own thoughts. He is speaking the word of God, empowered by the Spirit. And this is important for me, and I, I continue to think about this, and I'm always sharing this with my wife and others. It is the Spirit of God's job to take the Word of God to plant it into the hearts of people. Peter didn't stand up trying to get people saved or turn to Jesus. He just gave the message. He was witnessing. The Spirit of God now comes and takes the Word and jabs it into people's heart. So much that they were cut. But verse 41 gives us something beautiful. It says, they received His Word and were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 people souls. It's revival taking place. People are coming to know the Lord. So 3,000 souls uh, have have come to the Lord. In verses 42 through 47, we're going to see the behaviors of this spirit-empowered community. Let's look at it. Verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here is a beautiful picture of the early church. A beautiful picture. Verse 42 says, that these people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. These early believers were committed and devoted to the Word of God. The Word of God was their authority. They were people of the Bible. should be said the same for you and I. We must be people of God's Word. With all of the technology at our fingers, there's absolutely no reason for us not to have God's Word at our disposal. If you grew up like me, you grew up in a house that had that table with that real huge Bible <laughs> sitting on the table. Turn. It's, a, it's, it's, it's God's Word. Now, it may be turned to one text, but if you want to get into it, you can read it, right? Many of us have our own personal Bibles. You're here with your personal Bible, or we have iPads and iPhones and Androids where we can download Bible apps. I know all of us are busy. You know, we, we are going and coming. But we still have time for the Word of God because when we go on to work, we can put our, plug our phones into our cars and let Siri read the Bible to us. Coming from work, we can listen to it. People of the Word. We also have access to podcasts. Faithful Bible teachers who exposit the Word rightly, we can listen to them. So we must be people of the Word. Just like this early church, they, were devoted, they, were devote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Next word says, and the fellowship. This word for fellowship is the word koinonia, which carries the idea of partnership and sharing. Here were a people who were together. They often came together. There was some sharing. That was some, man, just some good old-fashioned getting together, which flies in the face of our culture because we live in a culture now where everything is individualistic. I'm by myself. This reminds me, um, and I was thinking about this, man, I'm often talking to my grandparents, and um, they grew up both in a, in a rural town in Alabama. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. About 40 minutes north of there is a place called McIntosh. I mean, it's country, too. Uh, if, if y'all know country, I'm talking about, like, if you get there, your cell phones are no good. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Like, or when it gets dark, it's so dark that you feel it. <laughs> that, um, so... This, this is where they grew up, and they would often tell me stories of my great-grandmother, who I did know, um, her house sitting on all of this acreage, and dirt roads, and people just walking. They just come up to her house, come in, and sit down, just, just fellowship, maybe eat, just doing whatever. But what they shared with me, that there was just a togetherness, a fellowship among people. And I remember a little bit of that growing up. Growing up, I saw a lot of houses with porches. And people sitting on the porch, and you walk by the porch, and you see Miss So-and-so, and and she know everything about you. Hey, baby, how you doing? But instead of us building porches now, we build fences. We keep people out. You know, we we have garages. You know, we go into our garage, and we lower it. We don't want to be bothered with people. This was not the early church. They were with one another in fellowship. And then it goes on to say, 
in the, the breaking of bread. Now, here the breaking of bread is not you going to Lambert's for some throat rolls, <laughs> eating good. Here is communion. Here was a body of believers who ate the bread, drank the, um, the, the wine, the blood of Jesus, remembering what he did. They reflected often on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The table for them was one of repentance in a place where they reflected on their sin. So they came together with the breaking of bread and then finally said, and the prayers. It was a community of people who prayed with and for one another. As I just stop and think, when I see God move, I see him move, I have to know that there's someone praying. I remember growing up, especially when, I, when the Lord gave me eyes to see and, and saved me, I would hear uh, from maybe an older lady in the church who would say stuff to me like, babe, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. That when we see God do mighty things around this globe, that there is a people somewhere praying. And this, or these early believers were a people of prayer. And verse 40, 43 says, and all came upon every soul. Remember, 3,000 souls just came to the Lord, and now they're about the believers, and there's awe. I'm around people today, and many of you are as well, when we hear about the great works of God, that awe comes upon us. Recently out east, just hearing about the team that went to India and looking online at all that was taking place with them. Seeing these men leave from America, go to India, a place they knew nothing about, not going there to build houses, but to build men. And looking online and seeing what the Lord is doing and hearing their stories about how people will walk miles just to come and hear the word of God, that just gives me a sense of awe. Or when I'm sitting with my friend Soup and I hear about other things that's taking place around the globe, I'm like, coming from where I'm coming from, and I just have a sense of awe. God is doing mighty works in and among his people because he's called each of us to be his witnesses who are spirit empowered. So awe came upon every soul. Verses 44 and 45 says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as, they had, as any had need. This was not communal living, because the rest of Acts, we know that these people had their homes. But what we had here are people whom the Lord have, has given resources to. And they held these resources openly, because they looked and they saw their brother or sister who had a need, and they did what they had to do to step in to meet that need. So they looked sideways and saw where they could step into the gap, and they did just that. Verse 46 says, And day by day attended the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. This is that Lambert's meal. This is that big meal. Now, this had me thinking of, uh, and many of us do this, Thanksgiving. You know, you go to that family member house, and it's a spread. You know, no matter, I mean, it's just food wall to wall. Again, thinking of my grandmother, you walk in, I mean, before you, you turn the block and you start smelling the aroma. Get into the house, man, you see cornbread dressing and turkeys and hams and pies and cakes. And <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just everywhere, right? We, so, but here's the thing. All of the family comes. This is family coming to not just eat because we do have our plates, but we're doing something more. We're sitting down and we're talking with one another. We're getting into each other's lives and we're seeing what's going on. There's a sense of love and connectedness there. This is what I think of when I see them in these breaking bread and homes, that people are just, just sitting down with one another over a meal. And it's good times. And the last verse says, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. These early believers were praising God for his work. And because of now of them being spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, witnessing, Scripture says they have favor with all people. One of the things that has been shared from the stage and that I have really been holding on to and thinking deeply on is as believers where we are planted, where the Lord has us, that to be such an influence so much so that if we leave, there is a void. People feel that void. These early believers had favor, it says, with, with, with all people. And the end of it says, and the Lord added to their number. We don't grow his church. He grows his church. 
It's our job to be faithful and just proclaim, witness. God sends his people. And so this was this early church. This was a bold church. And it has a lot for us. I pray for us here at Fellowship and for all churches who open and stand on the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. That they will be a church, that we all would be a church that's devoted to one another, that's devoted to prayer, that's devoted to fellowshipping. But as we've continued to see going throughout in chapter 1 and chapter 2, that we would be devoted to God's great mission. And that is to be his witnesses. I pray that for you and I. And I pray that that never leaves our heart. That we are on God's mission. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the work that you are doing in and among us. We thank you that you've called us to be your witnesses and that we cannot effectively be your witnesses without your power. And we thank you for, upon salvation, giving us your spirit. Uh, Lord, none of what we are and who we are, we deserve. It's been given to us by grace. I pray that what we've learned today and what we just looked at in Acts chapter 2, Lord God, will so be internalized that we will begin to live in light of what we see in this book, that we will see great gospel movements around the globe waiting for your return. As we reflect on the table, fellowship, thinking deeply on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, his body broken and his blood shed, thanking him for what he has done so that we could be the people that we are by his power, by his spirit, to be his witnesses.